which is the spotlight session uh, number two. Uh, and just a reminder, we're going to play the pre-recorded videos for five minutes, and then we're going to have one to two minutes uh, Q&A live. So the offers are in the now in the chat, and we'll then be called on to, uh, to answer any uh, questions that the audience might have. And you can ask the audience again through the, the Zoom Q&A or the Slido or the YouTube chat with some time delay. So preferred way is the Slido or the Zoom Q&A. And the first talk we're going to hear is from uh, Rita Lessin from John Moss University of Technology, and she will present Presenting Reform, a robot learning sandbox for the formal linear object manipulation. Hello, my name is Rita Laetze, and in this workshop, I'm going to be presenting our work on Reform, a robot learning sandbox for the form of a linear object manipulation. The motivation for this work came from observing similar software libraries such as RL Bench, Concept to Robot, and Assisted Gym, which aimed to enable reinforcement learning or robot learning tasks in simulation to avoid the costly gathering of data in experiments. However, we noted that in these environments, there was very limited inclusion of the formable object manipulation tasks. Here, we're actually putting all that we could find at the time, meaning the, the rope environment in RL Bench, the folding concept in Concept Robot, and then dressing someone in assistive gym. More recently, uh, there has been new work done on this, but for example, Soft Gym has released a benchmark on soft objects like cloth, rope, and even liquids. And Plastic in Lab has provided even more recently a library on Plastic in manipulation tasks. In our work, we focus on the formable linear objects such as ropes and cables, because we observe that this has been consistently studied and is still an open research topic. We can see uh, on this conference, we have still a lot of active work done on DLOs alone. So Reform is structured as the interface to the actual back-end simulator, which is AGX Dynamics, a set of environments that I'm going to be presenting soon, and a set of classes which we found are facilitators for changing the reinforcement learning problem and testing new tasks. If you want to see the full presentation, I encourage you to visit us tomorrow at 10.15 at ICRA. We identify the fact that sometimes the deformation is just something we want to avoid. Like when you pick up a bottle, we want to avoid spilling over by pressing too much. Sometimes it also can be negligible and we can just consider it as a source of noise in our manipulation task. However, there are many manipulation tasks where the deformation is the actual goal, and we could categorize them into two main classes. Explicit shape control, where the goal is to deform the object into a specific shape, such as bending a wire into a paper clip. And implicit shape control, where the goal is to manipulate the object into a configuration where we don't care exactly how it looks, but it has to satisfy some more abstract concept like tying a rope into a knot. For this, we proposed six environments. One where we want to insert a soft bag into a hole. Cable closing where we wrap a cable around the cylinder. A similar pr principle, but with a rubber band. And these are implicit shape control tasks. We don't care exactly how it looks, we just want that task to be completed. And then we have the explicit shape control tasks like bending a wire, doing the same with an obstacle, and then manipulating a rope on a surface. Reform has these three classes. Um, one of them is the end effector class, which just defines how we control the object. It can be with one or two grippers. Um, the compliance of the grasp can also be controlled. And there is an automatic scaling so that the reinforcement learning agent can always learn between minus one and one, but then there's scaling for velocity and accelerations that make sense for the simulation. There are several observation types. Um, notably, there is RGB and depth vision data. And then there's also the reward definition class, 
which we find useful, especially when there is no clear way to define the goal in a way that works well with reinforcement learning. And to know a little bit more about this, there's also going to be a presentation tomorrow at 1.45, uh, where we go into how elastoplasticity makes the problem of shape um, control harder. In summary, to use reform, uh, you need to, of course, have a Python environment, and it depends on GIMP. Um, it depends on the simulation software, HX Dynamics. And you can modify very easily the current environments by modifying the state representation, the control strategy, and for the explicit chip control problems, even the reward function. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a question. And in particular, I was wondering about the simulate the dynamics simulator that you employ. So the AGX simu uh, dynamics uh, simulator should be not free. And uh, if this is the case, are you also planning to include other simulators or are you addressing this issue? Yeah, well, um, it is true that Ajax Dynamics is proprietary. It's like Mojoko. They do have some discounts for academic use. And also, if we enter in some sort of collaboration, they are, are welcome to somehow have maybe even free access if you want to do something more specific within our project. Um, at this time, there's no plan to do to use other simulators. One of the reasons why we have uh, used this simulator is because they have specialized models for the formable linear objects. They have something called a cable model, which allows for this, um, as I mentioned, this elastoplasticity concept where we we can mod model metal wires quite uh, more descriptively. And also they have this rope um, um, object which we still haven't made use of, but it's quite promising because it allows for very, very long simulations of ropes and um, a lot of uh, a lot of complex um, complex um, knots and shapes because of how it's basically dynamically um, formulated. So, unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, but thanks. That uh, that makes sense. So. Yeah, I think it, the work is actually very interesting and it's something we are currently missing. Yes. So I think we, if we have no other questions, we can move to the next talk. And thanks a lot, Rita. No problem. So the next talk is going to be uh, Petro Perussi from the University of Strasbourg. He will present uh, learning robotic needle steering from inverse finite element simulations. Welcome to the ICRA 2021 workshop presentation, Learning Robotic Needle Steering from Inverse Finite Element Simulations. Here's a short outline of the presentation. In this work, we addressed needle-based therapies, in which precise needle placement remains a challenge. Robotic assistance has been proposed to both enhance the surgical gesture and to compensate the complex couple between needle and tissue during the needle insertion. In this work, we'll target specifically how the robot can account for the motion of these deformable bodies. The use of naive, rigid strategies for needle steering can lead to huge positioning errors. In green, we can see where the rigid strategies assume the needle tip to be and the result of a finite element simulation of the insertion. The state of the art discusses many approaches on how to model the needle steering and integrate it into robotic control. Both the kinematic models and mechanical energy models assume the needle insertion to happen into stationary tissues and only account for the needle deformation inside them. Finite element models, however, are able to simulate both of the deformable bodies and their interactions. We'll be taking a closer look at the basic et al. approach. The so-called inverse finite element simulations, or IFEM, are a promising solution. As you can see in the video, it is able to perform the needle steering in a complex trajectory while accounting for the soft tissues deformations. 
ISAM interprets the needle steering as an optimization problem. It computes an end effector position which minimizes three objectives in the simulation the tip to target error along the trajectory, the entry point motion, and the tangential efforts felt at the entry point. The solution is currently limited by the simulation complexity and can run at 20 Hz to perform robotic control. In this work, we propose to use a machine learning model to solve the inverse problem and command the robotic end effector in a higher rate. The method will learn from iframe demonstrations along 105 straight trajectories. Here are the main variables involved in the training process. We also chose to add uniform noise to the needle target position so it can better generalize to non-straight trajectories. We also compute the tip to target error for each time step and the displacement command uh, produced by IFM. The chosen neural network is called an extreme learning machine or ELM with a single hidden layer which presents fast learning speed and low inference time. As inputs it takes the robotic position and the tip to target error and outputs a displacement for the robot to steer the needle along the trajectory. The needle orientation is set to respect the remote center of motion at the level of the entry point. In order to validate our method, we'll test ELM on previously unseen trajectories of both straight geometry and curved geometry. We'll also test ELM on tissues with different elasticity parameters than the ones used for the training phase. Results show the ELM was able to successfully perform needle insertion in all the previously unseen trajectories. When varying tissue elasticity parameters, a small subset of the insertions resulted in unstable insertions and the robotic command drifts away from the target. This occurred for trajectories in the border of the phantom, where the training data is more scarce. A precision analysis shows the ELM was able to provide clinically acceptable precision along the successful trajectories. For curved trajectories, the tip to target precision of the ELM remained small, while the IFM kept a higher distance in average. Further tests are needed to address if this is an actual advantage of the ELM or if it's related to the additional entry point RCM objectives of IFM. Timing comparison shows a 60% reduction in computational time needed to infer robotic commands using the machine learning approach. As a conclusion, the ELM shows a promising ability to learn from IFM demonstrations and show relative robustness to trajectory geometry and elasticity parameters variability. Further tests are needed to compare it to IFM as mentioned before and future works will address the entry point variability and more complex simulation scenarios where the computational time advantage might really excel. Here are the references and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the, the training procedure of these uh, ELM models. Like uh, <laughs> how, how exactly are those uh, trained and like then how are they compared? I didn't quite get that from the video. If you could elaborate, that would be great. Okay, of course. Uh, so uh, we trained previously on a set of 100 straight trajectories along that phantom, that uh, well, rectangular phantom. So with the data exported from these insertions, we train our neural network model to be able to predict the IFM displacements generated during this training phase, during the database generation phase, actually. So then we use these weights to infer these positions in a validation phase where we got the results from. Okay, because I was a bit confused because it looked like the the the, the ELM outperforms the, the, the IFM, but it's trained on the IFM, right? Exactly, it's trained on the IFM, but for its straight trajectories only. Ah, okay. During the training phase and the database generation, we never use the curved geometries. Okay, thanks. Thanks for carrying this up. Really nice, Rick. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Good job. Um, then we continue with the next presentation, which is uh, Omar from the National University of Singapore.
and will present learning latent graph dynamics for the formal object manipulation. Uh, hi, I'm Xiaomar from the National University of Singapore. I'd like to present our work, Learning Latent Graph Dynamics for the Formal Objects Manipulation. Yeah, the rule of manipulation has been successfully applied to different tasks, for example, like autonomous driving, warehouse robot navigation, manipulating rigid body objects, and flying a drone. One special characteristic shared by these tasks is that they have a very well-defined state space. But this doesn't always exist in the world. Consider tasks like pouring water, feeding a kid, folding cloth, and also like making my favorite noodle. So these tasks, they remain very challenging for the robots. We think the major difficulty here is that the large degree of freedom when coupled with the nonlinear dynamics will make the modeling of the dynamic model and also plan with it very difficult. So in this work, we take a different view. For objects like cloth and robes, their dynamics can be sufficiently captured by a set of the key points. So this is similar to how human manipulate cloth. We only consider the key point, such as the shoulder, the collar, and etc. We don't consider the full dynamics of the object because it's not, not necessary, and our brain doesn't model it. So the key points can be further grouped into a graph, where the edges further capture the key point interactions and further improve the performance of the model. So in this work, we introduce Judum, graph dynamics for the thermal objects manipulation. Judum performs unsupervised key point detection directly from a top-down depth image. It extracts key point features, groups them into graphs according to the spatial relationships, and reasons a learned latent graph dynamic model for decision making. Specifically, we use graph neural networks to capture the interactions among key points. A graph-based model predictive control is introduced to improve the quality of the and simple efficiency of the plan. To effectively learn the dynamic model, we aim to predict the next state and minimize the difference between the predicted state and the encoded state directly from the images. The contrastive learning is further used to improve the quality of the learning model by contrasting the positive sample, which is the uh, predicted state, with a bunch of the negative samples that are irrelevant and sampled directly from the dataset. We train our model in simulation with randomly sampled reactions and show that the trained model can be generalized directly to a real robot without any fine tuning. We show that our model can successfully straighten and reposition the rope to different orientations. For example, like here, we reposition it, reposition it with a degree of 0, 45, 90, and 135. We also show that the model can be used to flatten a piece of crumbled cloth with different sizes and also fold them. Qualitatively, uh, we show the results in the previous slide, and quantitatively, Juden significantly outperforms the state of the art models on all role positioning tasks and also cloth manipulation tasks by a large margin. In addition, we show that uh, now the model can be transferred directly to a kinematogenic robot with only uh, simulation data. We mount a top down camera that is the Kinect to generate the uh, depth images. So here is a short demo video of the results. In this video, the bottom right corner shows the detected key points. Our trained model successfully straightens a rope and repositions it with an orientation of 45 degrees. In addition, it is also able to flatten a piece of cloth with only four steps of actions. And here are some additional visualizations of detected key points. So the key points are visually salient on both simulation images and the real world images. However, there are also some failure cases. The number of the key points can be carefully has to be carefully chosen. It might be noisy given extreme deformation of the object. The inaccurate detections introduce additional noise to the model, but with the contrastive learning, the learned model is still robust. 
Yeah, thank you for listening. More details are available in the QR code. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. We have a question from the uh, from Minguri. Yeah, sure. Minguri, uh, and it's uh, made a key point detection network extract different key points of the same object in different frames. If so, how to train the dynamic models based on the unfixed key points? Uh, yes, it's actually a very good question. So uh, the thing is that we consider that uh, the key points across different time steps as actually the partial observation of the object. So that is to say that um, the key points, although they are, they might not be aligned. However, like across frames, we will actually try to merge the key points to extract some kind of the global representation of the object. Then we use the global representation of the object to as the input to the network instead of the uh, exact uh, try to match the key points across the frames. Yeah. So that kind of eliminate the issue of the exact doing the exact key point matching across frames, and they might be different. And yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We have more questions. No, I think that was all. Thank you very much again for the nice presentation. Okay. Thank you. Interesting work. And we continue the spotlight presentation with. Uh, Meadat uh, Dorsten from the Northeastern University. I will present the formal object manipulation using model adaptive techniques. Hello, my name is Mertha Dorostian and I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University River Lab. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our work on the formal objects manipulation using model adaptation techniques. Manipulation of deformable objects is a challenging task both for humans and robots due to their complex, anisotropic and nonlinear mechanical behavior. As shown in uh, these figures, uh, the shape of a deformable object uh, can drastically change uh, depending on the applied force and uh, initial shape of the object and uh, many other parameters. In this work we suggest a new deformable object motion model obtained by adaptation from existing rigid object model. Considering pushing as a motion primitive in many robotics applications, in this work, we study the problem of pushing a deformable planar object along a desired trajectory on a flat surface by robotic manipulators. So uh, what we need is a motion model for the object. And then based on this motion model, we can calculate the proper action by the robot. The equation of motion for a rigid slider can be presented by a steady state representation x dot equals f of x and u in which x is the x and y position of the center of mass of the object and the orientation of the object and u is uh, tangential and normal velocities applied to this object. The main difference between a deformable and rigid slider is deformation so we try to take uh, this difference into account by adding an extra term to the previous equation which is g of x and u uh, times sigma in which g uh, stands for deformation effect and sigma is uncertainty so our trajectory tracking problem turns into a, uh, optimiz an optimization problem in which we want to minimize the deviation between the object's state and the desired state at each time step uh, with respect to some dynamical and contact point constraints. 
uh, to enable our robot to perform this uh, trajectory tracking problem, we uh, use adaptive model predictive controller uh, to and for providing fast adaptation to changes in the deformable objects during manipulation, we use the following uncertainty estimator to estimate the unknown bounded uncertainty in our system. Uh, however, uh, this method still suffers from uh, difficulties in uh, parameter tuning. For a better performance, we uh, use learning-based control, in which uh, we generated a dataset by pushing deformable object by different velocities in different directions and we measure the uh, motion of the object. We uh, compare this motion with what we expected from previous equations. And uh, this difference uh, represents the effect of uh, deformation in the motion of a deformable object. So training our a multi-layer perceptor regression unit uh, we use this unit in uh, controlling our robot we replicated each uh, experiment for 20 times and as uh, you can see in this result learning based approach outperforms adaptive model predictive controller to wrap up, in this work, we developed a model adaptation technique to represent the motion of a deformable object to demonstrate robust pushing task. Thanks for your attention. So thanks for the talk. Um, I have a... Um... I would like to ask if you may elaborate a bit more on the training phase and on which data you used to actually train the model and how you acquired them and so on. Yeah, uh, so basically what uh, we have done was uh, for each deformable object that we used, uh, we tried to push uh, with a robotic manipulator this object. We have we um, actually estimated the initial and final pose of the object, and then the vector which is uh, pushing the object, and uh, and also the force that applied by the robot to the object. So having this data and uh, the formulation that we have for rigid objects, uh, we uh, have compared these uh, two different motions and uh, used this difference as our criteria in our um, learning process. So we trade our data set and then uh, we use in our, this uh, trained neural network in our uh, optimization problem. And how many data did you need for the model? So, so do you have an for, estimate of the, the size of the data set? Uh, it's, uh, it's basically um, very dependent to the, uh, how the object, how uh, deformable the object is. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we roughly use like uh, 300 iteration for each object. Okay, thanks. So we have also other questions. So uh, from Joanna Vizzoni. And uh, first of all, which parameters were the ones that were difficult to tune manually in the first formulation? And secondly, how did you model the deformation? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question too. Uh, so um, adaptive controllers basically are um, hard to tune based on the deviation, the bound of uncertainty that is involved. Um, and in our case also, it was uh, a little bit uh, tough uh, switching between deformable objects. Uh, so, and what was the... 
continuation. Okay. Um, actually, we didn't uh, model the deformation object uh, itself. We modeled the uh, motion for deformable object. So we just uh, focused on what was necessary to predict the motion of a uh, deformable object in a sliding motion. And uh, yeah, we approximate the deformation in the object the, uh, in two directions. So our object was uh, kind of a slider object. So we didn't focus on 3D. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. And I think we can move to the next speaker. Yes, so the next speaker is going to be uh, Alberta Longini from KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and she will present uh, Perceiving and Handling Textiles, a Robotics Perspective. Welcome, everyone. My name is Alberta Longini, and today I'm going to, to introduce you the work that I've done with my colleagues about perceiving and handling textiles from a robotic perspective. Manipulation of textiles is relevant in many different fields. An example is fashion industry, which right now is undergoing a huge transformation due to sustainability concerns. The problem is that fashion industry is largely not automated, and that's because it has to face limitations that robots have when dealing with this kind of deformable objects. We were wondering, therefore, if we can find a common framework that could help to bridge the gap that there is between these two communities that are in fashion industry and robotic community. To do so, we firstly propose the textile taxonomy, which represents the production process of textiles. As you can see, we have two main branches. The left one, which represents the materials of the fibers that compose textile, while well, the second one uh, is correlated with the production methods, which basically means how yarns are interlooped or intertwined. Both of these branches play a fundamental role in defining textile properties, and thus also the interaction dynamics that textile have. And this is very, very important, but this just still the, pers the perspective of the industry. What we wanted to do is try to find a common point of view between fashion industry and robotic community. And to do so, we need to go behind the textile classification. We need to understand which are the most relevant properties that are worth being investigated, such as, for example, elasticity, smoothness, or color, or either the condition that an object, an object like a garment could have. And to do so, we need to properly use the latest sensing technology and to combine them with uh, the proper action, the manipulation action that could help us to understand and perceive these properties. But why a robotic framework could be relevant? This kind of perception is interesting from a robotic point of view. Well, because what we could understand is, for example, the status of a clothing item or it can be also relevant to understand how to design a control algorithm based on the application that we want for our robot. Or another interesting point could be how uh, different conditions or properties of objects influence the design of the algorithms that we want to design. A first initial example that we have done is related to the taxonomy that we have proposed. And we wanted to validate the taxonomy by a classification task and by means of the elastic property of the textile samples that we use to create our dataset. Our dataset in particular was composed by four stock measurements gathered by two robotic arms while they were manipulating and pulling the textile samples that we had. Initial results proved that these four stark measurements were carrying information about, for example, the construction techniques and also the materials. The image that you are seeing right now represents the 2D uh, projection of the, our four stark measurements. And it's clear how uh, we have here two well-defined clusters. 
based on, as I said before, the construction techniques that in, in this case are referring to the taxonomy that we proposed are woven and knitted. We are also able to prove that these first stock measurements were relevant to distinguish the materials, as well as both the joint combination of materials and construction techniques, meaning that the robotic framework is important when dealing with classification of textiles based on the industrial perspective. To briefly sum up, what we wanted to say is that there are many scientific questions related to perception and handling of textiles that could be also relevant, for example, to bring closer robotic community and fashion industry. There are many open problems and future direction that we would like to investigate and that we hope that other researchers will investigate. Thanks, Alberto, for the presentation. And uh, I would like to ask a question. So it's about the relationship with the, between the taxonomy that you proposed at the beginning and uh, then the set of properties and conditions that you have in the second taxonomy. So what's the relationship between these two taxonomies that you, that you highlight? Okay, thanks for the question, first of all. And the relation depends a lot on the task that you want to solve with the robot because uh, the textile taxonomy represents what um, the production method of textiles. So uh, it could be a matter of elasticity based on how close the yarns are, or could be also uh, the durability of clothes. The, the relation with the second table is more um, a terms of um, finding a common perspective between the industrial framework and the, um, and the robotic community. Because what we wanted to, um, to exploit with these two tables is that uh, there are some something and some stuff that are relevant from the, the robotic perspective that are properties of clothes, of course. For example, as I mentioned before, elasticity, or there are conditions that, for example, um, how old a cloth is could uh, influence also the elastic behavior of this cloth. So this is something that could be relevant for recycling purposes. But how to understand from a um, from the industrial perspective, the correlation between properties. Well, um, these properties are defined also by materials and um, construction metals. So mm -hmm. this was the goal. So to explain to the robotic community, which is the industrial perspective when they are producing these kind of um, fabrics and understanding it could help to, um, to have a clearer view for example, to understand elasticity because the anisotropic behavior of textiles depends on the construction method. So if you don't understand well the construction method of textile, maybe it's not that clear how to manipulate a textile or a cloth. So it was the goal not to have a strict relation because of course not all the properties of clothes are related to the taxonomy that we proposed, but it's relevant to know that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, so I think we can move to the last speaker. Yes, so the last uh, spotlight presentation, last panelist will be held by Sven Ditos from Artimines Robotics. And it's about localization and tracking of user defined points on the formal objects for robotic manipulation. Hello everyone, my name is Ventitas and I'm a software engineer and expert for advanced robotics at Artimines. In the next minutes I'm going to present the results of our approach on how to localize and track user-defined points on deformable objects for robotic manipulation. Manipulating deformable objects requires localization and tracking of points, which can be very challenging. Many state-of-the-art solutions are addressing this issue, but still have drawbacks. Some approaches are limited to specific materials, geometries or distinct features. Others focus on reconstruction rather than tracking, 
And doing this online means no points can be defined by the use of prior to execution. And then there are also solutions that suffer from insufficient precision or require markers on the object, with either one making them not applicable for most automation processes. Our contribution is a very generic approach that is geometry independent and doesn't require material modeling or learning. We propose a representation in which the resolution of the surface and the deformation are independent of each other. This allows to use a highly detailed surface model, leading to high precision, and a coarse deformation model, allowing for efficient computation. The model and the points of interest can be defined offline, which makes it especially suitable for automation processes, because no manual action needs to be performed during the execution time. We implemented a processing pipeline that works in an iterative manner to estimate the object's deformation from each observation. Knowing the object's deformation state then allows for tracking user-defined points on the object. In an offline procedure, the user demonstrates the model and the points of interest, and existing approaches usually struggle with large initial deformations. And we address this issue by demonstrating the object in multiple deformation states, which are then combined in a so-called object library. This only has to be done once for a new type of object. During the online execution, the deformation estimation is initialized with the most similar model from the library. For every iteration of the tracking pipeline, we pre-process a point cloud from the 3D camera by removing outliers and segmenting the object from the environment. In a second step, we identify correspondences between the deformed virtual model and the current observation. For this, we use commonly known projective correspondences, point plane correspondences, and feature matching with a shop descriptor. Knowing these correspondences is the input for defining a nonlinear optimization problem, which tries to minimize the distance between the found correspondences. And additionally, we use a regularization term for the occluded areas of the object for which we can't find correspondences. The regularization term is a commonly used as rigid as possible approach. The first step of our solver is to do a position update, which is a classic rigid registration. And then we leverage a flip-flop solver structure to minimize the prior defined error terms in an iterative manner. Once the solver converges, the next depth image from the camera is processed, and we continue with the next estimation loop. To close the perception action loop, we integrated an interface through which a robot can request the pose of a certain point at any time. And by calibrating the camera system against the robot, the manipulation task can be executed. But enough of the theory now. Of course, we've tested our solution on an actual robot, which can be seen in the video here. The deformed object is placed into the scene at a random position, the scan is performed, and the best matching model from the library is chosen to initialize the tracking algorithm. Now that the algorithm is initialized, a robot equipped with a measuring tip can move to the user-defined point. The algorithm is executed on simple consumer hardware, and it takes about 1.5 seconds to estimate the deformation. The entire algorithm can be parallelized on a GPU to improve computation time and achieve higher frequencies. This is subject to our future research. Now that the object is moved to a different position, you can see that the user-defined point is again detected very precisely. The average precision we determined in our experience was 2 millimeters, with a relative deformation of 20% with respect to the reference model. In the next step, you can see another deformation being applied and in the upper corner visualization of the converging algorithm. Once the deformation is estimated, the robot can begin with the manipulation. And of course, also a rigid and a non-rigid transformation can be detected at the same time within a single step. So now you see the camera taking another picture, the algorithm is converging and estimating the deformation, and the robot moves to the manipulation spot. For future research, we plan on optimizing our algorithm even further and also benchmark it against public data sets. For today, this is it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very impressive uh, presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the types of objects you, you can use. Like you, you said you need to learn it, the object once, and that seems reasonable, uh, but are there limitations in regards, for example, can, could you also use objects that are self-occluding, uh, which you then not see everything from your top view? What would then happen to the algorithm? Well, first off, thanks for the uh, invitation today. I'm joined by my colleague, Benjamin Alt. And uh, that indeed is a great question um, about the occluded areas. 
Of course, we can um, not find correspondences between our deformed reference model and the current observation. And um, that's why we introduced the as rigid as possible um, term, which is a regularization term. So um, for the occluded areas, we assume that uh, the parts that are occluded behave um, like or uh, in close relation to the parts that we can actually see uh, on the front side. And um, that allows for a regularization. Um, of course, if you, for example, have objects that have occluded areas within the objects that can never seen, or which have not a surface that can be seen from the outside during demonstration, um, then we cannot um, actually find out any positions within the object. But since we're focusing on uh, surface manipulation tasks, um, those are areas which are not uh, very relevant for the manipulation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just another curiosity question more, like I'm guessing you are more interested in the commercial viability of, uh, of this system. So is, uh, is your current uh, task time of 1.5 seconds or what it was uh, fast enough for that? Or like, can you give an uh, intuition about how fast the robot would need to do this uh, to be viable, to be set into the, in the wild? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's a, that's a great question as well. Um, well, you already realized that we're focused more on a practical approach. So we want to um, use the algorithm in an industrial environment and actually do um, real manipulation tasks. So uh, we figured that existing approaches do have issues with a initial large deformation. And um, that's why we introduced the object model library to actually um, handle these large initial deformations. And that is part of our algorithm, which is new. And we, um, in terms of a proof of concept, we implemented this and tested this on a real application. And 0.5 seconds is fairly slow maybe for a real application. Um, however, we implemented everything on a, a commonly used CPU. And the algorithm itself, however, though, is capable of being paralyzed on the GPU. And uh, we have not implemented it yet since we just first wanted to do a proof of concept if the algorithm itself is feasible. And uh, since we found that out in our first experiments, uh, we figured that we can now take the next step and put it onto a GPU. And we expect that speed ups of about 10 times to 20 times faster now, which gives us like a range of, let's say 10 to maybe 15 uh, frames per second. And that indeed is a feasible um, frame rate for a real world application. Thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing the next version. Then. Thank you for the invitation. Then we're going to go to the next point.